Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm gonna to unpack the antinomies of pure reason in the first critique, that is Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason. Now, this is incredibly complicated, so I'm gonna give you what I think are the necessary tools to understand it yourself, but it is by no means exhaustive. There are debates still ongoing about this chapter, this section, because it is riddled with ambiguity and just mysteries that, that have yet to be fully solved. Now, before jumping in that, into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe. I try to release two videos a week, but at least one. Uh, and you can find those on YouTube or in podcast form, wherever you get podcasts. If you want to help me out, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows, they might get a kick out of it. You can help me via Patreon or PayPal if you're into that at all, but obviously no pressure. And you can find links for all that in the description. And uh, yeah, let's jump into this incredibly dense and challenging section of the Critique of Pure Reason. Now, the antinomies of pure reason is Kant's effort to demonstrate that if pure reason follows along its course, it will inevitably end up at an impasse when trying to account for things that can be associated with transcendence, to put it quite simply, like God, like the infinite, like freedom. These questions, in order for pure reason to answer them, pure reason must go outside of the domain of experience, of the phenomenal world, in order to provide explanations for them. But by doing so, it doesn't actually have a firm ground upon which it can lay its criticisms. And so therefore, it opens itself up to not only refutation, but it opens itself up to its own contradiction in that the very opposite thesis that can be presented with pure reason can be equally true or equally false. So in order to demonstrate this, Kant provides us with four different arguments. And with each of them, he provides both an argument for it and an argument against it. And in each case, both are equally true. That is the thesis of the antithesis, the argument or the counter argument. They are both equally true or equally false. And as long as we are using this thing called pure reason, we won't be able to circumvent this impasse. Now he refers to these as four conflicts or four antinomies of pure reason, and they go as follows. Number one, and I'm using, I'm gonna try and use simpler language than Kant uses in order to make this as accessible as possible. The first conflict that he thinks of is whether or not the world, and by the world here, we can think of it in terms of the existence of matter, maybe the universe, just to make it quite as, as easy as we can think about it. The first one deals with the question of whether or not the world has an origin in space and time. The second conflict that he addresses is whether or not anything within this world, within the universe, is comprised of simple parts, which I'll explain when we get into it. The third one, the third conflict that he identifies is whether or not the laws of nature belong to nature itself or from a cause that is exterior to nature. And fourthly, whether or not there is a necessary being in the world or whether the world itself is a necessary being. So let's begin with the first one. And that is whether or not there is a beginning to the world in space and time, or if the world has a limit, if the universe is finite, or infinite. Now the thesis goes like this, that the world is finite in space and time. That is the world has a beginning within space and time. And within space, it has boundaries. That is there is an exteriority to the world. Now his justification for this idea is that if the opposite was the case, the opposite being that the world is infinite, and expands infinitely, that means then that between any two given points, an infinite amount of time or an infinite amount of space would need to actually elapse in order for any event to occur, which would make it possible 
if we understand human perception as the capacity to recognize what he calls a successive synthesis through, uh, there are so many, so many ways to unpack this, but as it works with the understanding and then into reason in the human mind through the faculties and other cognitive capacities, humans perceive the world successively. Now that would not be possible if there were infinite elapses of time between different events it wouldn't actually lend itself to any kind of system, any kind of systematicity. So it must be that space and time and the world within it are finite. They originated in a certain point and they do not extend and the world does not extend to infinity. It actually has limits. Otherwise that would imply that outside of the domain of all possible perception that the world complies to, Outside of that is something that cannot be understood in terms of perception, which then mean that it can't fundamentally exist in terms of pure reason. It couldn't actually grasp that. Now the antithesis postulates the opposite, that in fact the world is infinite and that it doesn't have a beginning in time and it extends infinitely through space. And this must be the case for Kant, and I'm saying this must be because he demonstrates that both the thesis and the antithesis in all of these examples are equally true. He says that this must be the case because if not, if there was a beginning to space and time, that would imply, or a beginning to the world in space and time, that would imply that the world emerged from nothing. It emerged from a non-world. And so there would not be a possibility of a world because something can't emerge from nothing. The same applies to space, that there is non-space outside of space, which doesn't make any sense. So space must then be infinite. It just must exist everywhere and for always. So that's the first conflict that he identifies, one that pure reason can't actually resolve. Now he moves into the second antinomy or the second conflict. And this one's incredibly difficult to, to really grasp when you get into the weeds of it. And there's still essays being produced about this very uh, conflict. This conflict asks whether or not any composite being, anything in the world, imagine a car, is comprised of parts or if it is a totality in itself. So the thesis goes like this, that all things in the world are comprised of simple parts, of parts, of things that make it up. Now this must be true, otherwise there would be no way to actually constitutively establish a composite set of things, anything that could then be lent to perception. So things must exist and they must come from other smaller things, even down to the point of atoms, for example, that comprise that thing and that give it a kind of materiality that can be understood and grasped by human perception. Now the antithesis says that there are no simple parts that comprise composite or total things. And the reason that that is the case is because all simple parts, no matter how small, down to atoms, for example, exist within space. And if we look at space, we know that it is divisible. Space can be divided an infinite amount of times or an infinite number of times down to a kind of nothingness. And that implies then that all things within space can be broken down into further and further points. There is then therefore no sim simple thing, no simple part that exists always and forever. Everything can always be broken down into smaller and smaller bits down to nothing ostensibly, which implies then therefore that simple parts do not actually comprise the totality of all things and that matter is certainly something that can be questioned. It is only something that exists within uh, human perception, which pure reason then has to reckon with, even though it tries to get away from human experience and human perception. Now this, I want to reiterate, uh, there are a lot of good resources on this one conflict that you can go and check out that really get into the weeds of this because it's, it's incredibly complicated. Um, but yeah, I won't belabor that point any longer. Let's jump into the third conflict, which goes as follows or asks the following question. And that is whether or not the laws of nature supply the conditions for causality and for its own being, or if they emerge from 
somewhere else, a transcendent site perhaps, like God, for example. So the thesis suggests that causality within the domain of law of, of nature, and that is to say that all things comply to the law of cause and effect, cannot have emerged from nature itself. In fact, it must have emerged from somewhere else, like a god. Now the reason that this is the case is because there are examples of spontaneity within the world that cannot be so simply attributed to cause and effect. And one of the ones that Kant gives, and he's he writes this as he's, or he thinks this as he's writing, he says, or writes, that if I just got up out of my chair right now, that wouldn't comply with any natural laws that conditioned I need to do that. Instead, this is only a spontaneous act that emerged from my own will, something that I only gave, I gave my own kind of uh, drive to. Now, what this adduces or what this is evidence of for Kant then is that there is a degree of spontaneity that disturbs the simple idea that all events are determined by preceding causal uh, causes that produce effects. So for that reason, cause and effect and the causality within the domain of the law of nature falls short of actually accounting for this possibility. Now, the antithesis says the opposite that in fact there is no beginning. There is no origin to cause and effect. There is no origin to cause and effect within the law of nature other than from the law of nature itself. So there is no spontaneous God that just arrived on the scene and willed things into existence or was an original point on the chain of all possible cause and effect or all possible causes. In fact, we only have the law of nature as cause and effect infinitely. And that is because there cannot be a cause outside of the law of nature and the cause that we understand within it that conditions the kind of cause that we can recognize within the law of nature, one that we can attribute to cause and effect or recognize within a chain of the law of nature. And that is because if there really was a cause that emerged from otherwise, it would be, in his words, confused and disconnected. It wouldn't actually lend itself so neatly to human perception as to actually be able to grasp uh, this successive synthesis, this uh, extension of events through time and space, where if we're watching a boat go along the water and we close our eyes for 10 seconds, we can probably with pretty good accuracy predict where that boat will be when we open our eyes again. Now, the only reason we have this capacity is through our understanding of cause and effect. That is a recognition of the movement of things through t time and space and how those things will then even condition things beyond them. And so we can recognize patterns and grasp the successive synthesis of all possible, the, you know, in his words, this manifold of all experience of all possible perception. So then he considers the fourth and final conflict, which asks whether or not there is a necessary being in the world at or as the world. So the thesis suggests then there is a necessary being in the world or as the world. And that is because within experience, even though there are massive alterations all the time, there are seemingly even spontaneous events that don't necessarily comply to uh, cause and effect, as we just mentioned in the third conflict, despite this, we can still have this thing called the successive synthesis. We can still grasp a totality of all events complying to an order, which makes sense. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to have things like community or perception or reason or understanding at all if things didn't comply to a specific ordering that we as humans are capable of actually tapping into an understanding. Now the antithesis to this is to say that there is no necessary being and that if there was one, it would only already belong to the domain of space and time. It would only already belong to the very world. Otherwise it wouldn't be able to condition it because as we've already been suggesting with these other conflicts, nothing, something cannot emerge from nothing. And the same applies here. There is no necessary being that just sprouted from nowhere that could condition something that is completely different than it. How a transcendence can produce this imminence or our world in how we understand it, unless of course that thing was already bound up with the world. And that covers these four conflicts. Now,
it, 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 what we can do with this is where it gets kind of interesting for me. And that is because in the four conflicts, the thesis in each of them implies that there could be a God that conditions being. Whereas in the antithesis, there isn't, where everything instead just operates infinitely, where everything is just committed to the domain of cause and effect infinitely through time. Now, interestingly, he says that it is with the thesis that we can find justification for something like freedom. Because if there was an original point somewhere along the chain of cause and effect that produced cause and effect, that implies therefore that newness or real spontaneity is possible. Otherwise, if we submit to the ideas of the antitheses, that is that everything is only committed only going to be kind of incarcerated by the law of cause and effect, then therefore there is no possibility for real freedom. In fact, we are always going to be determined by previous instances that do not actually allow for any kind of freedom. Now, what's the point of this? That is, if we can't actually decide whether or not the thesis is true or the antithesis is true, what do we do with these differing perspectives? Well, Kant says that we can actually resolve these differing perspectives by appealing to his notion of transcendental idealism, which subscribes to the idea that the world itself, even though it is a world that complies only to human perception, that is, we don't actually understand things in themselves, we only have an acknowledgement of them through our senses, which we then make sense of in our brains. So when I look at a chair, I'm not actually seeing uh, the chair in itself, I am seeing only what my sense data has provided to my brain, which then mediates that relationship to the chair. So transcendental idealism suggests that even though we are bound to this world of appearances, it nevertheless points to the fact that this world of appearances is absolutely true and that we can't go beyond it. So there is on the one hand, this world of appearances, and on the other hand, this world of things in themselves. Now, I know that there's a debate about whether or not to actually use this term world to imply that there's uh, a phenomenal world of appearances and a noumenal world of things in themselves. So just bear with me. I'm very much aware of this debate. Now, the reason that I'm using this is for simplicity's sake. But if we acknowledge that there is this world of appearances that we can take to be absolutely true in that that is all we can know as humans, and then there is this noumenal world of things in themselves, what we know then is the thesis that points to a possible transcendence or to a possible freedom belongs to the noumenal world, the world beyond our comprehension, while this law of cause and effect, while the phenomenal world that complies to nature as we know it, belongs to the phenomenal world. And we resolve this through transcendental idealism that acknowledges just how true this phenomenal world is while recognizing that there is this domain elsewhere from which maybe, or that conditions this phenomenal world, but that we can't actually have any grasp of. So he uses this in the second critique, the critique of practical reason, to supply a possible justification for moral judgments at all. Maybe they derive from this noumenal world that we are intimately connected to as humans. Because as humans, we look at ourselves in the mirror, we have a relationship to ourselves through our perceptions. We only look at ourselves or touch ourselves through our uh, mediating sense functions, not in itself, yet we exist as things in ourselves. So we toe the line as humans between these two worlds. And it is in that connection, by having one foot in this noumenal order, that we can perhaps actually derive possible nor uh, moral judgments, derive uh, an attachment to God if it exists. And yeah, that there's the antinomies uh, in fairly simple terms. I hope that I cleared it up for anyone that's been curious about it or for anyone who wants to understand it better that that was fairly clear. If there's anything I excluded, I'd love to hear about it uh, or anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, who knows, they might get a kick out of it. And yeah, catch you next time. Take care.